to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay. Uh, the first public input session is a 15-minute session with each person having than three minutes in which to make a statement. A second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his or her name, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residency opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions cannot be made during public input, for example, matters involving personnel. Is there any public input? All right. In that case, let's move on to number four, <coughs> minutes of the last meeting, October 3rd, 2019. <coughs> um, I hope you all had the chance to read it. Any comments on it? Any changes? It says I wasn't present. I wasn't present for the executive session. But, but you came into the meeting. Yeah, I think it's and I have you in here as added in. So yeah. it actually, at the beginning, it says all present except, and then it has you coming into the meeting at a certain time. Oh, okay. So that's kind of how that. it. That's that's because that happened for me. Yeah, it shows yeah. that you're there. It's just that you yeah. weren't there at the yeah. beginning of the meeting. So, mm -hmm. okay. And like for tonight, Becky's will be entered at six forty. It's just one thing um, under the student support, under the stands um, notes, it says other ideas for Noble Capital and. Oh, okay, oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. That's the only thing I saw. Got it. Any other comments? We would like to get a motion to accept the minutes as amended. I'll make that motion for some okay. minutes. Second? Second. All, right, all in favor? <coughs> I was not here. Uh, let me just do a hand count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, and are we? One, two, abstain. Abstain, yeah. abstain. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on to number five, employment, new hires, retirement, and resignation. Okay. Hold on, I got found my thing. So what is this thing right here? Is that, <laughs> All right, so I would like to uh, introduce someone to you, which you might say, see, we've already met her before, but some of you might not. Uh, we have a, a candidate moving forward to you as the uh, new director of teaching and learning to begin the full-time position on January 2nd. And her name is Dr. Shannon Swiger. She might sound familiar to you because she is currently an assistant principal at the Hussey School. Uh, Shannon, could you give a wave? And there we go. <laughs> Maureen, we'll give you time. You can pan over. <laughs> okay. So um, she, uh, she is a graduate from the University of New Hampshire with her doctoral degree in education. Major was literacy and schooling. Uh, prior to that, Sacred Heart University in Connecticut for her Master's of Art. Master of Arts in Teaching Elementary Education. She has been with Vivian Hussey for the past three years. Previously, she was in some other state, New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, New Hampshire at Seabrook Elementary School for two years. She was a literacy coordinator, Title I manager. She was also uh, simultaneously, she was doing some work as, at Salem State University, visiting assistant professor. Uh, doing orientation to learning disabilities coursework and she was also uh, during her doctoral dissertation she was the principal investigator in the role of professional development in supporting and developing effective literacy instruction uh, her result it resulted in the dissertation of growing teachers the practice of teacher leadership and its implications for professional development in literacy instruction and she has also been a reading support teacher, co-investigator and researcher 
uh, on some other projects at the University of New Hampshire that involved uh, language pre-reading, writing skills for young children living in poverty, um, and a thing called Granite Ladders, the Portsmouth Project. Um, she is noted for her research skills, for her, um, for her ability to relate to people, to be a, uh, a resource that people can reach out to, um, very approachable by students, staff, and families alike. Um, we also find her to have a, a very good sense of humor, which is a necessary prerequisite for any level of work. You have to be able to stop and say, we'll take this with a little, a little bit of salt and a little bit of humor and, and mixed in. And uh, so she, does, she never takes herself too seriously, I've noticed. Uh, I had to, when she came into the office for her, one of the interviews and I said, Dr. Swagger, she just went, oh, <laughs> Shannon. I know it's Shannon, but today you're Dr. Swagger. So um, she is, uh, has been working uh, already to make some connections with Heidi Early Hersey beyond the normal connections that she has in her role. And uh, Heidi was uh, very happy and pleased to hear that the person that we would be moving forward to you is Shannon Swagger. And she is also um, a person held in high regard by her administrative colleagues. So I would like to bring her name forward to you for your consideration. Is there any discussion on the board? Any questions? I think we're very fortunate to have somebody with his qualifications. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was a very, we were really pleased with the pool oh, that we had. Um, we, spent, uh, we spent a considerable amount of time in interviews and uh, it extended far longer than we thought. <laughs> so when I were looking at each other at one point going, okay, this is, this is, come on. So uh, we were very happy with the pool. All right. I have a motion to approve the nomination of Shannon Swiger as Director of Teaching and Learning. All right, do we have a second? All second. All in favor. Well, somebody has to oppose it. <laughs> yes, one, two, three. Audra four, might oppose it. Seven, eight, 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 eight. <laughs> yeah, for you. <laughs> yes, Audra might oppose it. So, uh, Shannon, welcome uh, aboard as of January 2nd in your new role. I, uh, the other piece that we talked about in all our interviews is that uh, Sue and I, the role that Heidi has, part of the crucial work that she does is the third leg of the stool. We have to have utmost ability to confide in and to argue with and to agree with and to oppose and to work closely with um, and to have everybody go home at the end of the day saying, that worked out great, we're doing some good stuff. And we believe that Shannon, she and I both came away from that saying, because in the first round we weren't even scorers. We, we were um, being, uh, we were receiving feedback in that and so we're we're very pleased that she's going to be the person we think she's the exact fit that we need for that third leg so congratulations hey. awesome. you, you had something you wanted to say <laughs> all right super see what you mean so uh linda was the second so on, on the other, yes, right. So on the other side of that, um, you might be thinking, okay, so what's the, the next piece? Um, uh, Audra has put forward a proposal to Sue and I about that, and we're considering that step. So I don't have any update for you yet on okay. the next piece. All right. Okay, uh, we don't have the students here tonight, so we're gonna skip number six, um, sabbatical report. Tim, how are you tonight? Great, thank you. Sorry to uh, damp you. Kind of rocked me there for a second. Yeah. <coughs> so as you talk to us about this presentation, are you also going to share with me how you have managed to become fighting fit? I want to know the secret. <laughs> There we go. All right. 
chair we go. So it's working. So in this, um, sorry about you have to turn. When I uh, put this PowerPoint together, there's probably about 40 embedded links that I was hoping to open and show you. Um, and I, at the end, if you all say, hey, good, then I'll share it and you can open those. There's a couple I'll try to open because I really wanted to have you see those. But when I open those, I have to stop casting, switch to another screen. They just won't open right up. The information that you share here, when after the presentation, Tonight, you give it to me and I'll, send it. I'll put it into the embedded into the minutes. She'll embed it so that way everybody can see. Yeah, so things. normally it is um, embedded right at the beginning. So like everything's embedded so when I'm looking at it on my screen it shows up, it just won't cast. Right. So that was just an issue I was having. I was here for an hour trying to figure it out and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go back and forth a lot because yeah, it's just Yeah, you'd have bit. to change tabs. It's, yeah, it's not I, gonna, all the tab yeah. stuff would be tough. So for those of you who don't know, my name's Tim Lounsbury. Hello. Um, I've been a school counselor here for 28 years, and it's been uh, my pleasure to work here. And I just want to say thank you for those who were here last year when Steve brought my proposal through um, to grant me this great opportunity to have some time to do some of the research that I did. Uh, and Sue was a big help uh, putting it forward. She met with me two or three times to tweak what we, what I had on there. So I really appreciate her help. And Mike's just my friend, so thanks, Mike. <laughs> So um, in my time here, the, the challenges of working with students, as you know, it's just, it's just really changed. And it's really all about the technology, the screen time, and I think the lack of kids going outdoors as much as they did. So why did I choose this topic? Well, I have a brother who lives in Texas. He's an oil guy, so he's got some money. He's a great guy, and he has a son, Sam. And he called me four years ago, and Sam was in crisis. And he said, hey, what do you know about the wilderness therapy programs in the country? And I had nothing to give him, and I really felt bad about that because he's been a great support to me and my family. And at that time, I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I don't know anything other than what I've kind of heard, which is usually kind of bad stuff sometimes about what happens out there. So it was a great opportunity for me to, to have that opportunity to go out and look at these programs. So that's the main part of the first part of my proposal. And then the second part is the opiate impact in that how that <laughs> has impacted us here at the school and what we can do about that. And I'm gonna talk about student X who uh, is one of my former students as well. So let's see, to go to the next one. Let's see, well, there we go. Let's make sure I'm going the right way. Yep, okay. So as we know, like living in Maine, myself included, um, my grandfather and I would go fishing a lot. And when I look back on that, I would always be like kind of sad about, hey, I'm not catching fish. But then I realize now it was really not about catching fish, about being outdoors with someone who cared about me and having those connections. And as I talked to my students, I remember back in the 90s, I'd often, I'd say, hey, what do you like to do? Are you into hunting? Because I coming down here, I realized many of our students were into hunting, and many of them back then said yes. As I interview my students now, less and less students are reporting that they are going outside with their families, and that main tradition of hunting and fishing has become less and less. Um, I actually have many students now who actually admit to spending a lot of their time gaming. They're like, well, I'm into it, but I don't do it. I do it in front of my computer, and it's really a little bit disturbing. Um, over time, we know about the Industrial Revolution, so people were outside a lot. Now, myself included, I'm inside eight hours or more a day in an office. Um, our students are as well. And in the past, last year we had a great uh, senior class. I think we had four Eagle Scouts, which was excellent. But the actual scouting, I would say culture has like, diminished a lot in our country. It's not something that as many kids do as before. So that just that outdoor is kind of, you know, it's gone down. And in 1986, um, you know, Freud came, came up with a psychoanalysis. Before that, I think people were just getting outdoors and enjoying the nature. Then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, you got to sit in a room and talk to someone to talk about your feelings and get better. And myself, I know that is very difficult. With students who come to me for something, if it's schedule change time, they're in there, they're engaged. If they 
want to talk about college, which is a big part of what I do. They're engaged. They're like, hey, I need this. They need something from me. They're engaged. When I call in a troubled student and try to work some magic with them, it's difficult. It's become more and more difficult over time because their attention span. So I think the wilderness therapy is a very interesting way to um, connect with students. So I kind of talked about this before. Screen time was not even something we had in our vocabulary probably 20 years ago, and now it's something that is, you know, we talk about all the time. Parents say, hey, you know, I'm trying to limit their screen, screen time and my student, and students talking to us about, hey, gaming is their, their choice of extracurricular activity. I hear that more than you can imagine when I talk to students about what they like to do when they're free time. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the history of the outdoor behavioral health. So there's this guy named Will White, so um, I'll fast forward a little bit. When I did part of my research and I actually traveled out to Utah and started physically going to places and talked to people about being from Maine, every person I talked to was like, oh, you must know Will Wright, he's amazing. So we're lucky to have Will White right here in Maine and he is uh, at Summit Achievement and he wrote this book and they're like, oh, when you meet him, he's gonna, you gotta get his book and have him sign it, and which he did. He kind of signed the book when we met him, which was excellent. It was at the end of when I was visiting certain places. So um, this book is basically, I tried to uh, you know, squeeze it down into a couple slides, but really outdoor, outward bound was kind of where it started, and that was more teaching outdoor survival skills. Like if you're outside, how do you start a fire? You know, how do you get through the night if you don't have, how do you make a shelter, et cetera. And then in the 60s, um, they started incorporating some for the mentally ill adolescents. Um, and then BYU had this program called 480, and that's where the youth rehabilitation through outdoor survival. So that's why, as you kind of get into it, you find out that why is everything out in the Utah area? Because there's such a huge amount of programs out there. It kind of came out of BYU and then all the people who were into it kind of stayed in that area and there's another reason as well I'll tell you about later. Um, so in the 1970s many programs started to open, most of them in the West and then in 71 Jerry Pye in Massachusetts took the outward bound model and he kind of said well a lot of people can't spend this much time and he he kind of tweaked it into the project adventure model that we still use today for, you know, we've had a project adventure since I've been here at Noble High School. Most of our students, they love it or they hate it, but the ones who love it, it's their favorite class. When I talk to them as juniors and seniors, hey, what was your best class? And many of them still say the project adventure and getting to that, well, I didn't really want to climb up and touch the, you know, the top of the roof, now they're doing it and then, so it's a different challenge for every student. So we still use that and that's excellent. And then Outward Bound in the 80s added the Substance Abuse Wilderness Treatment Program. So it kind of started you know, moving from just you know, getting out in the wilderness to actually using it as a treatment and a counseling activity. So what were the early challenges to wilderness therapy? Um, their guides were just people off the streets, people who liked to be outdoors. There was really no training. Um, you probably, when I first heard it, I can remember hearing about deaths with these young people who got out into the wilderness and they just got, most of it was from dehydration and not being well taken care of and there was a lot of bad press around people actually dying out, these young people dying back in the 70s and early 80s and that's again a link to um, one of those stories. So there was a need to regulate, incorporate clinical based approach. So the Outdoor Behavioral Health Care Council began in 1999, and the beauty of that is right at UNH. So we have um, Dr. Michael Gass, who is still there, um, and their job has been to really try to accreditate these programs and make them so everyone is doing similar things. Everyone, all the programs have their own unique approach, but that they're using um, staff that is trained and clinicians that have a minimum of a master's degree. So the Outdoor Behavioral Health Research Council, right? Um, I, this is one that, the one that I am gonna open up because I think you need to see this. Um, their goal is to have affordable evidence-based outdoor behavioral health care available for clients to the point there's significant decrease in overall rate of mental health and substance abuse 
issues in our side by 2020. I don't think they're gonna get there by 2020, but they are excellent. So I'm gonna try this little switchery ruski for this one slide that I want you to see. And so this is not gonna become a fumble ruski. Well, that's is that what you're telling me? That's what we are hoping. <laughs> so I go here, and I go back to cast. Uh, nice. Nice. Skills. While I'm here, so I don't have to do this again, um, I had again a link to their accredited programs. So they have these 17 programs that, that have gone through accreditation, um, including Summit Achievement, which is right here in Maine, which will be one that I focus on a little bit later, and the other ones that I, some that I visited out in Utah. So thanks for letting me do that. Let's see if we can make this happen. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. All right. So um, we talked about the programs. Is another excellent. Um, Association, National Association of Therapeutic Schools and Programs that I looked into. Again, <coughs> this is a, a link that I wanted to show you where you can put in any state and you can list any kind of program and it will give you a list of what's available. Um, so for example, I would put in Maine, they still call it wilderness therapy here. Um, the big push for the outdoor behavioral health title, as you can imagine, is insurance because it makes it sound for insurance, that's the big push that they're going for. But this is another excellent um, <coughs> resource for parents that I came up with that, or found that they could look at. Um, so I have this great spreadsheet that I, you'll be able to look at later, which kind of lists all of the programs. I looked into about 18 different programs. Um, Sky's the Limit Fund is the, one of the better organizations that helps fund these programs. As you probably know, these are very expensive programs. And Sky's the Limit Fund works with certain accredited programs to help parents with the cost. And these are the actual programs that I physically visit. So you can see that five of them are in Utah. 
and there's many, many more there. So <coughs> that was very interesting when I started looking. It was like, why does Utah have so many people, um, how many, so many of these programs? You had a summit up there, which is in Stowe, Maine. I think that's the one that Tyler Windsor. Yeah, so at. summit is awesome, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And Tyler worked there, and one of our uh, teachers' sister-in-laws works there. Miss Jess Miller's sister-in-law works there, who I met when I was there. So this gets into some of the similar research that shows these programs work better than you know actual, especially for young kids. So we're talking your 13 to 18 year old male and females, hyperactive kids trying to sit on a couch and talk to you is difficult. Getting them out and moving and actually working in as a group is where they actually do much better. Um, my nephew, for example, he had a really rough time. I think it saved his life going to this program. He came back and was he definitely had relapses, and, you know, it's, I would check in and he had a good year, then he kind of mixed up with some of the same friends and kind of relapsed, but he had the skills and now he's doing much better and he's on his way to a healthy life. So more statistics that I don't need to read to you. So um, why Utah? So it's kind of good and kind of bad. So if you are in Utah in one of these programs and want to call mom and get picked up, it's not going to happen. Um, you can run, but you can't hide. So in Utah, if you're under 18, they have control, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> so as I visit these programs, kind of, I didn't know what I was going to walk into. So picture walking into a really nice college's admissions office. The storefront of these programs is really nice. You walk in, you're, you, you're greeted by a receptionist in a very nice office with nice chairs, lots of outdoor pictures, um, a lot of conference rooms and admissions, places to meet with people. So um, it's pretty impressive, the, that part. I thought it might just be like, a, you know, we're going to go meet in a field somewhere and they're going to throw the kids on the bus and go. But it's not like that at all. There's a lot of upfront money that happens to get parents involved. Um, so I want to just kind of highlight a couple, one that I was not a big fan of, which was this Star Guides. Again, very nice and spent actually a day talking and watching some of their staff be trained and the next day going out in the field and from a distance, they didn't let us get really close, um, watch some of their um, interaction with their students. Their program um, is very kind of the old school, kind of beat them down till they don't have anything and then raise them up. And it kind of was kind of a little not comfortable for me to see that, that they'd, there were students out there and they're like, well, if they can't figure out how to make a fire, they'll be cold. If they can't figure out how to make this into a backpack, then they'll have to drag their stuff. So they'll figure it out eventually. And there really wasn't a lot of parent involvement. So that one for myself, I was like, I'm glad I saw it because it was a little bit shocking. It would be something like I'd really like discourage parents to look at um, as they, you know, research these types of programs. On the other end of the spectrum was, and this was probably maybe 15 minutes down the street, their storefront was the Evoke program. Um, and theirs was all about team approach, and rising students up through wilderness. Um, they had a lot of parent involvement. So they, students would write home. They wouldn't see their parents for the first month, but they'd have to have a, a letter back and forth at least three times a week. The parents had to have, take classes while their students were involved. If the parents wouldn't sign on to take classes, they, the student wouldn't be accepted. Because as we know, usually there's a reason for the misbehavior and that sometimes it's the parenting, or maybe all the time it's parenting, but you gotta kinda fix both ends of the spectrum. So we were very excited about finding this program. Um, again, a, a link here that you can listen to later. Um, their choice that they believe in individuals here at Connection to the Outdoors is essential. It plays a central role in the therapeutic process. So it's just being outdoors and learning skills. Now every program that was visited, students go through a hierarchy of you know, you're gonna get maybe better food if you learn this skill, how to make a fire, or you need to 
lead a group on a hike or you have to be able to do the orientation skills so you can get back and forth. Um, so they work through a hierarchy of skills and then they graduate and that graduation is when the parents here get more involved. So I'm going to play a little bit of Will White on here because, you know, we're from Maine and we got to like love this place. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit so you can hear from Will. But it shows you what this pro, like it's beautiful up there. And I, and I didn't even know this place existed in Maine. I'm like, Stowe, Maine? I had no idea there was a Stowe, Maine. So here comes Will. I think really what's essential is the sophistication of our clinical program. All of our clinicians are licensed by the state of Maine. They're all master's level, elite master's level therapists. The treatment team, the clinicians, work with the students and the families and the team to help the students meet their goals. And those goals are really tested within the three different environments the academic environment, the wilderness experience environment, and also the day-to-day -day residential living environment. I think it's really important to recognize that some of it is unique in that it tries to integrate those parts. Our students have a multitude of issues, including substance abuse, mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, ADHD, I think it's essential to recognize that the students who are coming to the summit have had years of doing pretty well and are now stumbling for some reason or another. Summit achievement works because the kids have three days of school and four days out of school. They have practical experience in school, they have experiential education. So I was very kind of thrilled that I found the best one right here in Maine. Maybe I'm a little bit you know, biased to this. Um, I liked Summit and the fact that it had a residential, they had beds. None of the other programs had beds. They, their beds are outside. But Summit has, you know, they have dorms where the students spend um, three to four days and they have an educational component. So if you're missing school, they have teachers who teach them. And then they go out for what they call expeditions for four days with a similar kind of, you know, working up different levels to meet more goals. Um, we spent at least six hours there, met with some students who were amazing. We had lunch with a couple of students, and I was, I asked Will after, I wish I had met these young students when they came in, because they were just, they you know, both were getting ready to transition back to, you know, school in August, um, September, back to their high schools and they were just very articulate about what they had learned. Um, there was a junior boy who's like, yeah, I'm gonna have to redo my junior year because I just totally messed it up because I was making bad choices, but now I know I have a different future ahead of me. So I was very impressed. And that was really the only place that let us like sit down without anybody around. We just had lunch with these kids. They could have talked about anything and they were great. So um, just an awesome spot. But again, very, very, um, expensive at this time um, and they de again have a family parent curriculum up there so you can see the uh, the cost so the big push right now is the funding off skies the limit fund which I have, again will have a link for you is um, the biggest one where they can you know parents can apply to this program they would fund up to 100% depending on the situation down to 10%. Right now the main issue is that insurance only covers the actual therapy part. So when I was talking with Will, he's like, you know, if I'm walking down the street talking to a kid and we're getting into something, they won't cover that. It, their therapy, like the, the insurance thinks of therapy like sitting in the room talking to the kid. If they're out doing the therapy what really works, which is when they're out as a group, out on these hikes and all these other things, they won't cover that right now. But the Outdoor Behavioral Health Center, that is their main goal right now, is to change that and to try to have the insurance cover more of that. And I guess they're making some inroads, so I don't think it's gonna happen by 2020. Maybe 2024, 25, 
but you know they're they're working that is their main main thing to do um, I think I kind of covered this that I think we all know we live in Maine probably for a reason because we like to be outdoors um, Again, two more videos, I'm not gonna get into them. You know, save you. you can look at them later. They show all about, just about the same thing, how important it is to be outdoors. 15 minute walk in the woods, and all that that does for your body, your heart, and your soul, and just making you in a better place. I was lucky to be up in, again, Rangeley, where they kind of went, I went to this program where they talked about the Icelandic model, um, which is where in Iceland they had a horrible substance abuse um, problem and they just kind of the whole community kind of tried to switch to go back the way things were before the Industrial Revolution and just try to get kids outside and involved in their families and out into nature and it's really changed their the statistics are pretty amazing so when you I send this to you, you can look at the uh, link there will take you to the statistics of what's happened there and that's where I got it kind of takes me through um, you know for me, professionally, I knew nothing about these programs, and now I know a lot. I'm not sure if a noble kid will ever go, but now if a parent has some questions about it, and it's definitely worked on my, um, how I'm interacting with my students. So I'm gonna kind of switch gears and talk. I had a different, um, I had the student's actual initials up here. This is a student, I, I see a picture of every day. Um, in the hallway, and Sue's gonna know who this is. So, um, I got to know this girl probably this time of the year as a freshman, because as Noble High School, as you know, we're working teams, and when students start having issues, the teachers talk to each other, and we put it, we get the, uh, we get the, <laughs> gotta get on camera. Um, yeah, too far away from okay, then we get, you know, the noble cares people coming back. So I met with a student a guidance counselor, got the Switzer counselors involved, the health center involved, and that person kind of rose up and got through freshman year. Okay, still making some tough choices outside of school. Um, and you know, we got the family in sophomore year. Again, kind of a rough start, but by then we had Switzer counseling involved. And you know, we're a very, you know, we got a lot of, you know, protective factors here at Noble High School as well as Mike's school. And this is even before bar, before we had the bar program, which is even more, you know, so we kind of rose the student up. She got to know Miss England and got involved in the multiple pathways program and just blossomed. There was still this little bit of substance abuse problem happening, which we kind of knew, but I remember I kind of, as they go to multiple pathways, they switch counselors just because the way it's set up. But I'd see this student, we'd still talk, and I had her sister. And I remember I'd kind of hang out by the front doors a lot in the morning. And her freshman and sophomore year, she had run out of class, and she was coming in the morning running. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I gotta get the multiple pathways, I can't be late again. And she was like running to class. It's a, it was just like this amazing person. I see her, I got this picture down here. Mm -hmm. So she graduates and we kind of, as it happens every year, at least with me, you know, we talk to the seniors and I was like, oh, I'll come back and see you, Mr. Lounsbury. But I know, you leave high school. <laughs> I might get some emails right now because I got kids who may be struggling at school and they want to switch to YCC here, SMC here, or vice versa. But the kids who are really struggling don't reach out. And then two years later, when the opioids started hitting, we lost her. She died. And I see her every day. I walk down the hallway, and she's, there's this picture of her senior year at a pep rally, looking at the camera. And she was kind of my motivation to, about this. Like, what do we do? Are we doing, did we do enough? Did we do enough for this girl when she was here? I think we missed a piece, and I'm gonna talk about that. A little bit. I think we did great, but I think we're missing one little piece, and I missed it, too. So that's all the stuff I did. I went to these cool things. I had this great chat with Gordon Smith, who was actually at that Rangeley. We had lunch together. And um, these are the things I did as we talk about the opiate program. It's an epidemic. I don't think we need to talk about this ad nauseum. I can still remember probably 10 years ago when I heard heroin at school. And I'm like, heroin? I was like, no way. And it, I don't think it was happening with our students, but it was starting to get out in the streets and kids were talking about it, and I was floored. And now, 
you know, it's just we hear about it every day. And I'm sure some, most people here have had some relation in your life, whatever big your umbrella is, and been impacted by this crisis. And I don't think it's a crisis in our school, but I think kids are starting to make some tough choices that may lead to um, things that happen. So I kind of did my research on what's, how does it work? How do you, you know, the integrated medical assistant treatment program. So I did all my research about how you fix this program. And it's great, we, like, like we have everything set up for people who want to get help. So if people want to get help, they get help. And they get help um, in a lot of, um, so this is substance abuse and um, opiate use disorders. So when I was down at this York Hospital Recovery Center program, and they said that the beds really don't work for these programs as well, because these, kind of, these people or people who are, who are addicted need to have counseling and medication and putting them in a bed, there's not enough beds even close to have enough beds for the uh, people who need help. So there's kind of like this, they call it the, um, um, the hub center. So a hub is you'll go to some place to get your Suboxone or whatever you, your medication is to make you feel like you don't need to use. And then there'll be um, counseling places outside the hub. So they have the spokes, the main place you go for your medication, and the other places you can go to see counseling whenever you need counseling. And it's working. It's working in Maine. Um, as you know, the, the deaths have decreased, but it's still a major issue. So I'm going to go back to talking about student X, who, um, in talking, when I went to all of these programs, I said, hey, part of my thing, I'm supposed to put this resource manual together. And they're like, well, what good is a resource manual going to do? I'm like, well, I don't know. That maybe doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> I, if I hand a resource manual to a senior as they graduate, it's going to, they're not going to keep it. And they're like, well, why aren't you telling them about 211 May? And I'm like, oh, 211 May. Is that, tell me more about that. So, Mr. Roberts, if your wife falls down and needs something, who are you going to call? 911. 911. I think if we did re uh, uh, research or asked every one of our students, probably from kindergarten up, but if we just went from Mike's school from 6 to 12, I bet you every kid would know if your parent is hurt or if you're at an accident, you call 911. But I don't think any of our, and me included, I've been at this for 28 years. I have never called 211 with a student in my office. I've never told a parent, listen, call 211. That's where you can get all the information you need. So these are the hub centers, and I don't think paper copies are necessary. I gave you a bunch of paper copies because I wanted to see. I could print 10 more of those things out. But 211 is pretty amazing. So I've called them a couple times just to check them out. Um, and you get a live person 24-7, and what do our students have with them all the time? Cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was talking, the first time I just called up, then I had some problems, then I said, sorry, I'm just kind of doing some research. And they were amazing. She's like, where do you live? I'm like, I live in Kennebunk. She's like, okay. And I said, all right, sorry, I'm kind of doing this for some research. But the person was really nice. She's like, oh, this is, this is great. Thank you for, like, doing this. I said, well, like, how do you, do you talk to teenagers? It's like, we get texts from teenagers. Some teenagers don't want to make that call, but they will text us. And when you text us, there's a live person on the other side talking to them. So I got all, I just said, hey, listen, I got this presentation coming up. What do you have? Again, need your permission and Steve's and Sue's and anybody else's to make this go forward. But I guess my proposal is to increase our 211 usage. And they have, they sent me all this stuff and I can get more. So I just want to, you know, there's all these good little, you know, these things, you know, there's, I remember I found a magnet in my office that had 211 on it. I'm like, probably came through, put it in my office, never used it, never used it. I have all these other things and this nice note from the director that says, you know, because I said, hey, I'm pre presenting in front of the school board, what do you think? And she's like, that's awesome. I hope they say yes and you can publicize and we can get you as many things as you need and just don't 
tell them that if you call 211 or text your zip code to 898-211, you will always get a live person in Maine 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. You will talk to someone. And this is not just for, you know, kids who are struggling with, um, if they have an uh, addiction. This could be helpful for your, with your friend, and she's talking about her boyfriend who used to be nice, but he's not so nice anymore, and he's controlling, and now it's become more than that, and now I got some bruises. You can call 211 and they'll get you help. If you're out of school, I know Sue talked to a, a family a little while ago, and you're pregnant and you're really struggling because you don't have any money, you call 211. They'll get you help. They cover everything. And I'm a little embarrassed to say I have never used them with a parent or a student in my 28 years. Never, not once, but I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna change that for me, and with your permission, I would like to make that kind of be my big thing moving forward is to, with, you know, with my department, probably I don't think we need to go beyond where Mike starts, maybe sixth grade's too early, we can talk about that, but I think in high school, with our health center, we need to get the word out that, so when you, graduate and you're in that tough spot and that's why I said maybe we didn't do enough for student X that she probably didn't know about 211 and we're, we'll never know we're never gonna know if that's gonna save someone but at least they'll leave having that knowledge that hey if I'm in a crisis 211 and it's everywhere 211 New Hampshire exact same thing so if they're there it works so kind of that's my proposal 911 everyone knows I'm hoping that our students and I've kind of started with my freshmen that I've been interviewing. I'm like, you ever heard of 211? And they're like, what? what you, a 911? I'm like, okay, just, you know, there's this thing called 211. So, with uh, your permission and blessing or whatever, I would like to have this be the big part of what I bring back to the school. Um, the first part was very, um, it was professionally uplifting, but I think this part, and I, I printed out those lists for you to be like, what's this list doing? We don't need them. Every school counselor here, we talk to each other. When parents come in, we have this great support system. We have the health center. We have the Sweetser counselors. We take care of our kids at Noble more than any other school I can imagine. We're good. Sorry, we are. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but we're a good team. But when they leave us, if they don't go to school and have counseling, if they're out in the world struggling, I think that's where, I think that's where we kind of fell down. That is it. Questions? I think you're on the right track. I, I think it's really important to get this out. I had a situation last week where I needed to know 211, and I was like, I think it's 211, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And I should have been sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, I, I think this is great. I can't wait to see this rolled out. It's just one more resource yeah, exactly. for people. And who knows if that's going to be the one that's going to make a difference for this person or that person. I love it. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I know the price tags on the, on the uh, outdoor behavioral education is, is significant, but I think one of the really good things is that there are a lot of uh, national endowments or, or philanthropic associations that would probably love to provide a school in a rural state like this part of Maine some funding to make opportunities happen for, what if it's one student, two right. students? So I would say as a department, go for that too. Right, we'll do. Yeah. This has been think, really good. I don't think that it would be wrong to go below middle school. I think that little kids are very aware of you know, 911, we taught that in second grade. Mm -hmm. 211 kind of dovetails with that if your family's having trouble. I mean, a lot of them do. And they right. might be the, the source that takes that information back to the parents. Right. So I would say get those posters out in the elementary schools too. Right. Thank you. That was Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. I will share with Sue yeah, and she'll share. share. Be in, in There's all sorts of cool links in there. Yeah. I yeah. Oh. <laughs> sure. For cost.
Hi. Did I? I, got it. <laughs> I don't know. I heard that. Yeah. All right, number eight, financial summary. So you have a copy in your, I believe it came out in the packet? Yep. yep. Okay. So the only number that I noted in there that somebody might have questions. If, if you look in, you'll see, you might see some categories and say, hey, wait a minute, the uh, the remaining percentages, uh, it might say it's it's 6% uh, or 9% at this point of the year. Well, some of it's supply, so you front load, and then other things. If you look at the encumbered, for instance, under regular instruction, it is 13 and a half, almost $13.6 million. And I bet you can guess what that cost is largely about. It's people and employment. Um, and then special education, six point, almost 6.2. So there's uh, close to $20 million encumbered in that area, which is why you see 8% or 6% remaining in those categories. Any questions on the financial summary? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> are we still looking or are we ready to move on? All right. Number nine, emergency plan update. We uh, had a tabletop exercise with York County Emergency Management and with some support from Bonnie Eagle administrators who came to visit us and we, we went there to help with theirs and, and I was supposed to go today to one in um, Kittery <coughs> but that was postponed because apparently York County Emergency Management was tied up today. Um, yeah. We're holding on to something today. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in our tabletop exercise, we focused on evacuation and reunification of the largest single site in the districts that I'm aware of in the three communities, uh, that being Noble High School. 1,350 people at any given moment in this building. I would say that's larger, has to be larger than any shift, than the daytime shift at Pratt Whitney. <coughs> I think they've got their, what, 1,500 total, and they've got skeleton crew third shift, and uh, they've got two shifts, two other shifts. So um, we, we had a very good exercise there. Um, they're still in the process of pulling the feedback pieces together, but uh, I was personally, I was uh, really pleased with uh, the response of the administrative team and the crisis team that's involved here at the school. Um, we continue to move forward with our work on the um, memorandum of understanding with a, a site that I've talked to you about previously that we would use as a, our evacuation site. Right. On to <coughs> the policy readings, number 10. Uh, the Joanne or Estrita, would you like to talk about any of these in particular or how would you like to proceed? Oh. <coughs> We have, do we have copies of these? They were, yeah. they should be, they should be <coughs> if you go down. Yeah. And they've got um, the I red highlights closed and so the forth. wrong window is what I did. <laughs> All right, um, why don't we just take them one by one? What's the first one you're looking at? First one is KF, Community Use of School Facilities. Can we start with the, if we go down the list? Oh, they're in alphabetical order in the uh, in the list, yeah. So it's oh, J, okay. yeah, J, J is the first, if you, if oh, you go okay. down to the uh, list okay. itself, okay. where the changes what, are made. What, what letter are we on, J, what? Well, I think if you look oh, at the, the list, it's J-I-C-H. Right, right, okay, J-I-C-H-R. So okay. Student okay. Substance okay. Abuse okay. Administrative okay. Procedure. Um, so we used to, there was no, yeah. there was no, uh, sample model for that but we did use we did find another school system that had a, a very nice piece that started the policy out with this is a voluntary help section and it was a very full body piece um, and then it got into so what are, what are our responses when we have situations that we have to uh, enforce and students are not forthcoming yeah. um, so the red section is is um, pulled from another district and we like that because it is all voluntary and it explains um, that a student can um, seek help 
before there's a violation, but if there is a violation, um, if they do break one of the rules, they can't say, oh, I want a voluntary, I want to, you know, say that I did this and get off without any um, uh, disciplinary action. So we do have the procedures underneath um, <coughs> underneath that with what would happen in the different grade levels. The first one is K through seven. And there's just a few changes on that because um, some of the names have changed. It's no longer the student assistant support team um, under A out of five. It's uh, now the student support team. So that needs to be changed on all of the um, going forward. And there were a few that were missed. Yeah. So we get to Oh, we missed some of those? Yeah, we just have to okay. clean that up later. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I just to see one little typo. Yeah. Yeah. Substances shall up on letter B up at the top of that. Just need a space there. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Good. right, right. So I like, just got I like the wording of this. And then it's broken down a little bit later um, for, for high, um, 8 through 12. So there, it's a little bit different for the K-7 procedure um, than for the 8-12. So this needs to be indented more because this is two the way <coughs> this is one. So it's a one and the two is in the same level as the So it's on, uh, on section two, so where it yeah. says type yeah. two. Mm -hmm. And that would we'll push the other stuff over too, I think. Okay. Is it? Uh, actually, yeah, no, it shouldn't. The rest yeah. of these are okay, but this, the, the yeah, number two needs to heading. go in. Yeah. Section two. You, the number two. Two. The number on page two, two on page two is too far to the left because it's it's um, it, it's Roman numeral two capital A one right. and Roman numeral two yeah. capital A two. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Let's see. Do, uh, <coughs> we need to know where each one of the um, lines are. We have to change it to uh, the student. Um, Support. Uh, no, I'll, I'll go back I'll through that okay. with okay. a uh, search. Okay. An F search. Right. Find any, the other ones. Any questions or comments on this? And at the end of it, we did a lot of cross outs because ours is a very the, brief section right. on um, self reporting. We really, we really thought that that should start. The, right. So start that's, the that's what's at the head of it now. Yeah. Basically. Any questions or comments, concerns? It's a lot of work, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Can we get a motion to? I'll make a motion to accept, accept the policy. I'll second it. All in favor? Here you go. Thank you. Yeah. This, is, this is the JICH, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. you OK. Sure? Next is JLCDA, Medical Marijuana in Schools. You may remember back probably about this time last year, there was discussion about it because the legal counsel was working with the state on should this be something that is included in the administration of medication <coughs> uh, policy that you already have existing or should it be a standalone piece? And so we kind of stalemated at that point and waited to see what the result of that was. And this is the result of the recommended policy. Any questions? I have a question. So it says here that the student can't possess it, only the legal guardian? Yes. So this is my unfamiliarity with the law. Um, they can be in possession of it even though they're not the card go because they're the legal guardian, correct? So, yes, so the, they're transporting the person, it to and from the school. The person who is considered the guardian may bring the substance in. Whether, personally, I don't know if they need to have a card while they're outside of the schools with a, a legal aspect to, to law, mm -hmm. but as far as being able to bring the substance to school and oversee the uh, the 
the consumption of the oils or whatever else it is is not smokable forms. It meets our guidelines. And where do they do that? Where do they administer? Uh, we provide them. Um, there's two, two or three different options here, but it's not in the clinic. I'm pretty sure that outside of the school, it's a similar guardian type arrangement. I, I don't know exactly what it guess, is, but, but I don't. I couldn't swear to. I've, I've only known it for younger kids. Um, don't know what the ages are, but I think the parent is or guardian is. Mm -hmm. Sort of has to go through all the same. I, I would think so because <coughs> some, if you're carrying it and it's yeah. a prescription, you have right. to have something in case who the prescription is for and why you have it. Mm -hmm. But Actually, I, the rules change a little bit when you go to the school. So it's, you know, to be at home is one thing, but then the offense, yeah. the criminal offense, elevates when it goes onto a school grounds. So it's just, I'm wondering if that was ever addressed. Not with the committee. Not at a, not at our level. And but this is also medical use, which isn't in the same form as a recreational. Right. So no. it is a well, smoke to recreational. I suppose people do it in many ways. Yeah. But um, the context is different, I think. Than what you're pointing. All right. Do I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I'll second. A second. Okay, Nancy. All in favor? All right, excellent. On to the next one. Um, NEPM slash NSBA uh, code KF, Community Use of School Facilities. So there's a highlighted piece there that says that the fee structure is supposed to be looked at annually, and that was something that previous to, as we combed our way through the hundreds of <laughs> policies and getting, getting to this piece saying, oh, okay, we're supposed to be looking at that annually, so we need to add that to our list. Um, you'll see the term uh, e-cigarette devices, which is a generic term for any of the pods, uh, kinds of contraptions, or the electronic nicotine delivery systems as well. And you'll also see that we have added in, um, in case the JLCBA passed, we added that piece in. Principal designee has the final approval of the request. And that's because at different schools, different people fulfill that role. We've also formally proposed the name change for the form that's to be used mm -hmm. so that it fits the procedure. And, and cross reference those forms yeah. that will come up next. All right. Any comments, questions? I um, good. good cross reference. Yeah, at the end of that, weren't we going to have the cross reference of KF E? It is. It is. Yes, on that E1 one. and okay. E2. Okay, it's not. Yeah, we've got KF A and then KF E1 and KF E2. It's in the online one. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, great. It's really minor. Mm -hmm. That's Please, what happens yeah. when I print them off to work. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks like the font. It's like what did it, did it go to a different format? font? I think so. At the end of oh yeah, um, page two different size. Okay, so on the bottom of page two. On eighty sixty, we'll identify the area or areas. Yeah, this is different than above and below. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom page two. Yeah, font. It's either the font style or the size. Is it KF, which is KFA it? or KF? It's KF. It's KF. Okay. And it's um, no, letter E. Good catch. All right. Can I get a motion to accept? Um, okay. We just read KF. KF. I'll make a motion to accept KF. All right. The second. I'll second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Thank you. Not, mm. Now we're going on to KFA, um, which is the facilities use fee schedule and contract. We're giving it its official code and also made some corrections, alterations. Yeah, so previously it was just a form that was used, and some of it primarily for the Huzzy Auditorium, and some of it for other school spaces. Well, some of the school spaces don't exist anymore. It talks about the restaurant or it talks mm -hmm. about the uh, child care center. 
and then some of the pieces were applicable to everybody so we made it more generic and then we also um, called out specifically things that were for the auditorium uh, right right we pulled out yeah. Pulled, yeah it was kind of haphazard bullets before that the three things in there and so we clustered the auditorium pieces together to make it a little easier for Matt Eaton to go this is for the auditorium part what is, um, do we have a minimum number of police that have to be hired, or how is that? So, like outside, inside? Yeah, it's, it is based on the numbers, so if you have a, <coughs> let's say we had graduation, I think we have to have 47 police, no, but there's, no, I'm just kidding, uh, but the, the number of people that come to, if we have an indoor graduation is, is astounding. Um, so that's one that um, is a little problematic for us. The others, we do have numbers. Um, there is something on the numbers, but it's not listed. It's, it's I think, because it's in it's town policy. So like, oh. you have to, it's based on what your attendance is, how many police officers so it would be like on their application yeah, form, but not on the policy. Okay. And then 10% is uh, like of their revenues? Or what is 10% for these fees, $800 or 10%? It just says whichever is greater, but yeah. is that, yeah. what does that mean? Yes, of the total money that's anticipated to be taken in. Do people often come up? So we really tell you don't. That it should be more than 800. <laughs> well, what we re so so let's say we know that they're going to rent out the auditorium for a dance recital, and that they typically, with the most of them are annual customers, and they, if we have 974 seats, they fill 974 times a certain number, and that's the agreement that is developed. Yeah. Um, we really don't have that many groups from outside that are for-profit entities mm. that come to use it, many of our facilities at all because we just don't have time left over for people to do that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's largely the auditorium. It's a good auditorium. Mm -hmm. It is. Yep. I only had one question. Were we gonna keep additional contract information but take away the colon and center it? Yes, that's what we had discussed. Um, so if you go back up a little bit, I took that off because it seemed like a arbitrary. Well, it it just it really continues from page one. Uh, and that should say one of two on the first page. And can you look down and see if this is one of and page one are, two? This is two of two. Two of two. But she said yeah. that the numbering was all off yeah. until she got everything because of all the. Oh, okay. So, all right. so what, when I was looking at that with Jen, I said I think that that title should should just go because it's really the whole thing is all. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's additional because it's on a second page, but it's just a continuation. Okay. So it should be one of three, two of three, and three of three. Okay. If that's that makes sense. No, that's fine. All right. Do I have any further questions? Um, is that Okay. All right. That's just KF-A. Yeah. Yes. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to accept KF-A. And a second. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Um, KFA points users to the actual contract form. Um, we, because sometimes it's just the auditorium and sometimes it's other facilities. It made sense to um, label it KF-E1 and KF-E2, though they are going to be the front and the back of the same sheet. It's just that sometimes people are gonna to need to fill out both sides and some people, yeah. sometimes they're not. Yeah, if you're not renting the auditorium, there's stuff we don't need from you, but if you are, we need both pages. And it was just, in the, in the um, text, was easier to say that by saying you need this page right. <laughs> as opposed to going if you're going to do this or this. Yeah. so that's why we and that, did that way it's not well if you're at this school you have this piece of paper and if you're at that school you have this one and so forth we just said look they're all in the same policy they're all easily accessible by any group 
and they're they're in the handbook uh, they're in the uh, the board policy manual now so readily accessible there's one um, we need to remove restaurant where do you uh, see that it's I thought it was crossed out oh, oh it's okay. not online it's not oh restaurant and that's on e what's the number one. on this one that's on e1 oh, yeah, yeah, it's one. crossed okay. out in the yep. chart e one. Child, yes, child okay. care is crossed off yeah yes. right not the restaurant okay. nice who spotted that one john well, we talked about that we did. Like, yeah, so I, like, in, in, in when memory. Jen and I went over these, I'm amazed we got That's the only 95 percent of it. And the reason we've changed the AED text is it's not all the schools have town square. And this is meant to be applicable across the board. Right? <laughs> um, there's a little bit of a typo at the bottom just before the signature damages or disarray. You've got one extra space in there. Damage for uh, the damages. Uh, for damages or disarray? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And hopefully she can squeeze oh, yeah. these all. So I think it will, because I mean, yeah. for example, you just need the one AD, more line. Yeah, yeah the exactly. AED line that's yeah. crossed out is going to um, mean that the page number oh, is going to yes. fix. It's yeah. just, yeah. Uh, all right, so that's page one, page two, or E2. Same thing, I think we're going to be able to fit that. Yeah. Uh, What's the sound right here? Yeah, it's location. a little weird it's because, located. like, when we cut and paste to put these into a separate it's Google Doc the versus DVDs the one that's mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. they, they yeah. show the Don't numbers come out. Yeah. yeah. I'll see a, like, page two of three right in the middle of the first page. Mm -hmm. Some place that you think, why is that even here? So really there weren't any changes to E2 except that we specified that it's the Hussey Auditorium. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions, comments? Oh, they, they crossed it out. I'll make a motion to accept KFE1 and KFE2. All right, can you get a second, please? Nancy, all right, all in favor? Thank you. And that is that. Yay. Okay. Good job. So Come we have a, we have several more well, that are in the shoot for yeah. second readings now. So that's why we don't have first readings listed because we just need to get back together and do our catch up. We've already got some editing done, but uh, we have to be able to put it together and pull it for the subcommittee. And then I just sent you one today that Aaron Dixon's been working on with mm -hmm. uh, a representative of the state board for tobacco cessation or something whatever it's called I forget something to do with tobacco that they've done a review of our policy for us <laughs> I thought that was nice all right um, 11 other do we have any other very briefly I came to a picture of these kids from Hussey Elementary and then I noticed I recognize the guy that's in the picture with them this it, it must have been fire oh. fire prevention presentation mm -hmm. so Travis uh, <laughs> we have you here in in spirit here or in picture um, and, and I was at North Berwick Elementary the other day when um, bus to the bus came in and did its presentations it's a it's I don't know if you've seen it it's, it's about this big and it's an actual moving bus that's run remote control and they speak through it and so oh, forth and the eyes blink and the lights come out and it flashes and it they can move it around it's huge, it's huge, and the kids, the kids love. Doesn't matter, fifth graders, they love it. Yeah. Like, oh, can I try that. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah. Um, so also, uh, Josie Chadbourne, who is our um, field hockey coach, she sent me a note from an activity that they did there, which is very nice. Good spirit, a community spirit builder. Um, good, good connection for the district. It says that uh, each senior on senior night selected a teacher that they felt was inspirational to them during their K-12 to educational journey. So the six seniors picked a teacher. She reached out to them to attend the senior game. We're going to do this in a winter sport, too, and then do it in a spring sport. Uh, they said it was, awesome the idea. answer was, hey, this is so cool. Girls picked a variety of teachers from first to 12th grade. Mm, that's cool. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody picked a superintendent. Anybody pick a superintendent? <laughs> Oh, or you? No, no. Um, so he, what we have, I'll pass some pictures uh, one way in the other. I think that was a wonderful idea. Yeah. Isn't that awesome. nice? Cool. Yeah. Anyway, here are some shots of the players uh, with their 
Oh, and by the way, she said, uh, none of this would be possible without Mr. Watson's support. He's the real hero. He actually started doing this in Mount Ararat, I think, several years ago. And, uh, or Gray and Gloucester, I forget what you said. That's really cool. Hey, Gray? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we kind of brought the, the notion with him. And, and uh, I was at a basketball game in Westbrook last year and saw them do it with the seniors. I thought, geez, this is great stuff. And then the next thing I get is something telling us we're doing it. So uh, Ellen Nason had her one two, grade one two teacher, Lisa Corain, Kaylee Sprague high, had brought high school teacher, Katie Riley, with her. Kelly Kremen from, uh, brought her sixth grade ELA teacher, Mel Stevens. Emily Carlton brought high school teacher, Julie Gagnon. And then Tristan Hoffman brought, um, she, she went for a twofer on this. She said, I'm going to bring Jim Winslow and Spencer Hodge. And Libby Hayden brought her four or five teacher, Jamie Hallmar Stewart. Hmm. Really nice. Nice. Cool. nice. That really takes teacher appreciation to a whole new level. Doesn't it? It's wonderful. All right. Uh, do we have any other others? Any public input? Can I get a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. I mean, it's good. That's really fast. Okay. <laughs> All in right favor. On the Bruins are on tonight. Sorry. Who, who had the second? Me. Okay. <laughs> so fast I didn't even hear.